Good morning, everyone. Um, looks like it's about 11 o'clock. Um, and we may have some more folks joining us in the first few minutes, but we'll go ahead and get started today. Um, thanks for everyone for making the time to join us today for a presentation of research findings on understanding crypto mixing services in context of the open and dark web. Uh, my name is Carrie Riddle. I'm the Deputy Director at the Criminal Investigations and Network Analysis, or CENA Center um, for short. Also on the line today are CENA's Director, Dr. Jim Jones, and our DHS Program Manager, Dana Saft. For folks on the line today who may be a little bit less familiar with the center, I'll give a really quick summary. Uh, CENA is a DHS Center of Excellence based at George Mason University. Uh, we're funded by DHS through a 10-year cooperative agreement uh, under which we can conduct research on problems and challenges of interest to DHS as it relates to understanding organized crime and criminal activity uh, with the ultimate goal of supporting efforts to disrupt those activities. And in CENA funds uh, a number of projects through this agreement that are executed by teams at universities across the country. And our teams share research findings, knowledge products, tools, and trainings that can help support DHS and law enforcement efforts to dismantle organized crime. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's time and interest and support of the research today. Uh, we'll have time for questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, and we're very interested in hearing from our DHS and other government or law enforcement uh, joining us today. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Holt from Michigan State University and his teammate, Dr. Olga Smirnova from East Carolina University. Uh, Tom is a professor in the School of Criminal Justice, and he's been leading a CENA-funded project uh, that is investigating the size and structure uh, and, and character of criminal markets on the open and dark web. Um, and this has included a study of different products for sale, such as cybercrime services, firearms, and other illicit services and products, as well as the payment systems involved in these markets and the interactions and dynamics between the vendors and sellers. Um, the team has a number of research briefs and papers that are available on the different aspects of their research, uh, which we're happy to share with folks today on request. Uh, and the findings that Tom is sharing with us today are focused on crypto mixing services and the role that these can play in illicit transactions within different contexts. Um, so Tom and Olga, thanks very much for being here and for sharing your work today. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for attending. So um, you may be very familiar with the dark web. You may be unfamiliar with the dark web. So given the variations and the potential for uh, audience awareness, we're going to approach this from kind of a high level and uh, consider how crypto mixing services, essentially money laundering via cryptocurrency, operate. And I'll try to give you some broader context for how these systems work in general. We've been, as was mentioned, we've been studying various markets for different products on the open and the dark web for the last few years. And one of the most interesting aspects of market change that we've been able to observe is the transition from certain payment platforms like, say, PayPal to cryptocurrencies. And now for some vendors, using cryptocurrencies coupled with these crypto mixing services. And that's only within the span of a few years. So it's interesting to observe change in real time, essentially. So what I'm going to mostly talk about today is the way that crypto mixing services fit into the broader context for cybercrime as a service. And that can encompass any number of different products. Essentially, if there are illicit goods and services being sold online, that can be characterized as part of this broader cybercrime as service economy. And uh, you may be familiar with the QVC network. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents used to buy quite a bit from QVC. And uh, it's a home shopping based network that you can find on cable, but they also have a website and different ways to purchase goods. And the name QVC actually stands for quality, value, and convenience. And the reason I show this slide is because when we talk about the general underground economy for different goods and services, there's a tremendous focus among the customer base on the quality of products, the value that they obtain from buying said product, and the convenience of making a purchase and managing the products after the fact. It's interesting to think about it in this context, but most of the vendors that we observe work in a similar fashion to what you might observe with general e-commerce and legitimate business practices writ large. 
as a whole, the vendors, no matter what they're selling, have to begin by creating an advertisement. And that can take place on a variety of different platforms. We see these in shops, uh, which is a single vendor operated space. We see them in forums where you can have multiple parties selling simultaneously. And uh, to differentiate them, think about a shop as a store in a strip mall. It's a single operator place. You could have a bakery next to a nail salon, next to a kid's toy store. So it's a, a single place or a freestanding box store. Compare that to a forum, which is more like a mall environment, where it's a single enclosed space where all retailers are working together to offer product. And you can find competing vendors within the same space. So thinking about, say, a Macy's and a JCPenney and other large retail stores, all offering different goods within the same single location. And that creates some challenges for the vendors. And in an online space in particular, vendors have to find ways to differentiate themselves and demonstrate their legitimacy. They often will use photos. And uh, for some vendors, if we're talking about physical commodities, like say a firearm, may use pictures of the product itself. They may use images from the legitimate marketplace. But if we're talking about trying to demonstrate that you have the item in hand, some people may take photos that are at at least appearing to come from the vendor as a means to demonstrate their capacity. In addition, we have vendors typically noting how you can pay them, how to get in touch with them, and giving different modes of communication. Increasingly, vendors are utilizing Discord, Telegram, different types of social media in conjunction with their shops as a means to separate out communication. So that way, whatever you're talking about isn't necessarily occurring within their retail space. And forums are increasingly sort of a signal space where you can talk about what you offer, but then drive people to your individual shop. So vendors can set themselves up, but the problem is trying to be identified. Customers have to be able to find you in some fashion. On the open web, that's relatively straightforward. Google and most search engines are gonna capture a large majority of websites, some not, but at least there's enough of an inroads to find a wide range of vendors. On the dark web, however, it's a little bit different. Dark web services are not necessarily easy to access, and so there's a degree of word of mouth or recommendations from vendors or even communications via social media, all with the intent of trying to drive customers to your specific retail environment. And once they're there, the customer then negotiates with the vendor in order to complete a transaction. Usually that's going to involve requiring some specificity in what you want to purchase, uh, say thinking about the vendors who sell illicit documents, like say passports or identity documents. You've got to say what country, what city, what uh, state in some cases, and you have to be specific about the details of you as a customer. So again, if you're buying an identity document, what information do you want on the document? And then what cost are you willing to pay for the item? The advertised cost is not necessarily the final cost for product. There's a degree of back and forth that customers can engage in with the seller in order to find a reasonable price for the product. And once the product price is negotiated, then the vendor and the customer have to complete a payment. Increasingly, that operates through cryptocurrencies, which are basically a form of a digital currency that may or may not be tied to fiat currency. And increasingly with things like Bitcoin, they're not tied to a fiat currency and therefore their, their value can go up and down by the day. And there's a range of cryptocurrencies that exist. The other aspect of cryptocurrencies is that the wallets that hold your money are to some degree hidden. And so the information about you as a customer may not be visible to the public. However, the transactions between crypto wallets can be and will be observed via a ledger, which is uh, usually done via blockchain. So it provides a way to ensure and track the path of payments between two wallets, even if you don't necessarily know who the wallet holder is through public information or otherwise, you can at least know a payment of X amount of Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency it is moved between wallet X and wallet Y on this date and went through these portions of the blockchain to get there. So it's a public but encrypted documentation of payments between wallets. 
We do still see some vendors taking PayPal or different kinds of electronic currencies that aren't crypto, but most vendors are cognizant that it's a big risk to do so. So once you negotiate the payment and it's provided, then the goods are delivered. And once that product is delivered, if it's a physical commodity, we're usually talking about shipment via FedEx or DHL. If it's an online product like, say, stolen credit cards or malicious software, it's going to be sent to you specifically in some way. And that's often negotiated between the buyer and the seller. At that point, the customer has the ability to provide feedback. And that is particularly interesting because that gives a way to map out how many transactions are completed or at least the degree of satisfaction among customers. Going back to that idea of quality, value, and convenience, when you can observe public feedback, and if it is in fact reliable, it gives you a sense of the quality of the vendor who you're working with. And that's gonna come into play when we talk about the crypto mixing services in general. I've mentioned the dark web a few times, just for the sake of clarity, to differentiate the two, the open web consists of any website or service that you can access via your regular web browser. So whether you're a Firefox user or Chrome or whatever your preference is, you can get to those sites via a search engine, via your regular browser. So the surface web is often the components of the internet that you can access without any kind of login or anything else. Then there's the deep web, which some people refer to as the portion of the open internet that may be firewalled in some fashion. So that could be anything that's username and password protected, uh, paywalls within, uh, say, media environments, or for a lot of cybercrime groups, they may have a public facing open website, but you can only get there by knowing that URL by paying for access to the site and then having a username and password. They may turn off the indexing features so it can't be captured via a search engine spider, but it is still on the open web. That's where the majority of content on the internet, at least in terms of World Wide Web content, appears to exist. There is a smaller proportion that operates on the dark web. And the difference between the dark and the open web is that on the dark web, you can only get to the sites by using an encrypted browser application, like say Tor, that's one of the most popular. There are others out there like Freenet, but Tor is a very easy and free platform to use. And it encrypts your web traffic and provides a protocol that exists within the Firefox browser. So you have to download Tor. Once it's installed, then you can go to dark web sites, sites that are hosted on Tor. And those that are on the dark web always end in the extension .onion, which means you can't get to them by using a regular Firefox or Chrome browser. So once you're on the dark web, the other thing to note is that there aren't necessarily search engines in the same vein as what we see with Google or other tools. DuckDuckGo indexes some dark web sites. There are services like the Hidden Wiki as well, but essentially all they're doing is flagging a site that exists on a URL and retaining that in a list. It's not necessarily the most up to date, but it is an attempt to document these services that are out there. There are others like Torch and some dark web search engines that exist like Ahima, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, but they're effectively based on what is known today. So it's harder to index the dark web in the same fashion as what we see with the current services that are out there on the open web. And as I mentioned, Tor works by uh, sending your encrypted communication through other users in the Tor network. So basically what happens is that when you go on to Tor, your traffic gets routed through other people who are Tor users. And so when you go to an open web site, it's not going to index you as the requesting service. And this is an image directly from Tor. Uh, you're going to see Bob's computer as the last hop. Uh, the server Bob here is going to recognize that last computer as the one making the request, not Alice's system. The value of that is that it provides a hiding in plain sight for people who want to anonymize the amount of information that's out there about themselves. And Tor wasn't started as a means to engage in criminality. Instead, it was created as a means to secure communications and protect users and their privacy or to get around existing firewalls that are in place and uh, thinking about, say, like country level protections that are in place. This is a great tool for uh, Chinese individuals who want to get around the Great Firewall. And 
we've seen a transition where actors are now moving to Tor as a means to host criminal content. And that can include any number of different things. Some of the images I'm going to show you here are from direct dark web shops. Uh, one, for instance, is Exploit, uh, Zero Day Today. It's a place where you can go to buy zero day exploits and uh, try to purchase them via Bitcoin. They're not all new. They're not all necessarily the hottest and the latest and greatest. Some of them are very simple. Some of them are known. But it is a place you can go to buy exploit code to engage in different forms of hacking. As we mentioned earlier, there are lots of guns for sale on the dark web. There are a number of different vendors offering product. And we see the pricing for these firearms in an interesting context. They're not being sold at a high value relative to what the item is. It's usually just a little bit over general MSRP in a US context. So vendors aren't making huge profits, they're making minimal profits as far as we can tell. One of the other tools that we see quite a bit and one of the other services that are offered on the dark web are credit card numbers. Uh, this is an example of a dumps vendor called Mega Dumps. And when you log into their site, you can go through their shop and pull out all the credit cards that you might want for a specific state, city, country, and you can really drill down to financial institution and price. So you can essentially set how much you're willing to pay at any point in time for a given product. And uh, Mechadumps works by taking a deposit from the customer and then enabling them to engage in one-click shopping, kind of like with Amazon, where if you want to buy these cards, you just hit buy now. But you have to have a deposit with the service in order to do that. And we've seen this quite a bit with different operators today, which creates some risk for the buyer in that if you're depositing money with the vendor, you have to hope that number one, they're going to provide you with what it is that you've paid for, and number two, that they're going to exist long enough for you to utilize that deposit. Uh, you may be familiar with something called an exit scam, where a site that takes deposits suddenly disappears and no longer is in existence, and they take all those deposits with them when they shutter. So you might be able to net several hundreds of thousands in Bitcoin, depending on the volume of traffic that you are able to generate. As you can see here, they utilize multiple forms of crypto in order to take payment. They take Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dash. But there's lots of other ones, Ethereum, you might be familiar with Doge, just given its popularity. So there's a lot of different services that they'll take. And uh, if you're unfamiliar, this is what a crypto wallet looks like. It's a series of numbers and letters all strung together. So it can be hard to track these things just using general pieces of information. There are tools that exist to do analyses of transfers between Bitcoin wallets and other crypto wallets. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But um, just knowing that it provides some context for how crypto payments work in general. And uh, some vendors are very good at actually giving you real time translation so you know how much a certain item is going to cost you given the value of cryptocurrencies can go up and down. Like they're saying here, uh, it's a calculator essentially for how much you're going to spend. Now I mentioned shops. The other thing that we see on the dark web are what are referred to as crypto markets. And crypto markets, if you're unfamiliar, are essentially like the, the mall kind of environment where you have multiple vendors offering product. And these are found only on the dark web. In order to get in, you have to create an account with the service creating a username and password. And since crypto markets go up and down, they're very keen to show you, here's how you legitimize our site. Here's how you know it's us. They'll provide you with a PGP key, at least the better ones will, and give you a means to validate that, yes, this is the site that I'm looking at and it's not a scam site. You can compare the PGP keys for the services and know what's what. Now this example, Vice City, sells a lot of different products and drugs are one of their more popular items. And you can see they've got a range of drug types and drug products, and they're all given in Bitcoin as a value. They provide a USD purchase value, but then they also will give you the Bitcoin translation. And uh, just as an example, if we were interested in buying oxycodone from this vendor, they sell it in 10 quantities or 10 piece quantities, but they can also go up to 500 piece quantities. And essentially that price drops down when you're buying in bulk as a means to entice customers to buy more or to at least to buy in quantity. And once you decide to make a purchase with this vendor, this site operates similar to other ones where you need to make a deposit. The site will hold the money on behalf of the vendor 
And once you've received product, it'll be released and they'll give you ways to validate the payment. As you can see here, they're showing you a crypto wallet and a QR code so you can make the payment. And uh, you have the ability to track your balances, your withdrawals, and know how much is happening at any point in time. They'll use Bitcoin, Monero, other services, and you'll be able to manage your account as it works. One of the reasons we think people have transitioned to cryptocurrencies in general is that over time, there's been quite a bit of attention placed on digital currency providers by law enforcement internationally. In the US in the early 2000s, a service called eGold was popular among cybercrime groups because you could pay via eGold, which had a tie to the value of gold at that point in time. The individuals who ran eGold were eventually arrested on money laundering charges. And so the service essentially folded after a little while. And we've seen this with other services as well, like Liberty Reserve. So when these sites generate too much attention, the operators eventually come to some kind of end that reduces the legitimacy of that product in real time. Instead, you've got to find a different platform to work with. And crypto is thought to be a more secured, more easy to use kind of platform, at least at the moment, relative to these other kinds of digital currencies. And with crypto in general, there is the opportunity to seize cryptocurrencies and track them through services like, say, Chainalysis that will enable you to track the transitions between wallets and do some analysis to figure out who the operators might be. But this requires quite a bit of investigation and time. And we've seen the ability to track crypto wallets and crypto payments over time, even with something as old as, say, the Silk Road, which was an operation through the late 2000s and into the early 2010s. And that site eventually folded, but there are still investigations coming out of the Silk Road and the crypto payments that were involved there. So one of the ways that offenders have gotten creative in terms of how to deal with the risk of cryptocurrency tracking is through the use of crypto mixing. Essentially what that is, is a service that mixes your cryptocurrency in with other crypto wallets. And so that way the crypto payment that's moving can be split up and transitioned across multiple service providers. And there's tons of different vendors out there for this kind of service. You can find them on both the open web and the dark web. So the prior one, Chip Mixer, we found on the uh, open web. We found Penguin X here on both an open and a dark web platform as well. And they give you quite a bit of visibility and discussions about the value and why you might use this. So given an interest in crypto mixing, we tried to collect as much data as we could from as many crypto mixing vendors as we could find. So we were able to develop a sample of about three open web service providers and unfortunately, as you can see here, a lot more on the dark web. So we have 15 dark web vendors and three open web. And so that gives us a sample of about 18 different services. So we saved all the content from these sites and then engaged in a qualitative analysis of the language from the vendors to understand how they operate. One of the things that we were interested in understanding is how these services are advertised. Uh, we utilized what's called a crime script analysis, which in criminology is a way to think about the phases of the offense from start to finish. So what does an individual need in terms of tools, techniques, information in order to offend? What do they do once they begin the offense? How do they enter into the process? What happens as the process goes on? And then how do you exit from the offense? And so we were looking at the preconditions, what drives an individual to potentially want to use a crypto mixing service. And this quote here provides a relatively straightforward explanation. It's a service when you want anonymity, when you don't want people to be able to know who you're paying and why. So this service talks about being a blender, making it hard to determine where the payment came from. Basically, you can protect yourself, your income and your personal information and they want to hide you from blockchain analysis as well. So tools like Chainalysis, which are built to do that, 
are effectively trying to mitigate their effectiveness. Another vendor stated that we are here to keep your transactions being noted from the bad guys so they can get the best from the service and not have to worry about being detected. We proudly say that Chainalysis can't analyze our transactions and find the real source of funds. Another one said it's for extra privacy and it's not against the law to mix bitcoins. So they're trying to say it's it's worth doing if you have concerns, if you're interested in maintaining your personal privacy, it's worth doing. And uh, in general, how it works differs by vendor. Some talked about essentially moving a supply of Bitcoin. Uh, so Bitcoin in general, there's a finite amount of Bitcoin that exists. And so if they're able to take a payment from you and then push it back out to you in a different set of coin, then it's going to appear as though one payment went to this wallet and then multiple were dispersed to other wallets, effectively as a means of obfuscating where the payment came from. Another service vendor 13 here noted that uh, they get newly minted Bitcoin. If you're not familiar with minting coin, essentially what they're saying is that they have services that will try to generate Bitcoin. You can do this through crypto mining, essentially uh, where you validate exchanges and paths in the blockchain and you get Bitcoin for doing it. So effectively by creating and maintaining the public ledger for cryptocurrency payments, you can get crypto money in exchange or you can get crypto back for helping to support the cause. So when you mine for crypto, it's a free-ish process. You have to pay for electricity and things like that, but it at least generates revenue back for you. So if you can mine a lot of cryptocurrency, you can then use that as the basis for your potential mixing, as they note here by vendor 13. Another vendor talked about the process in general. They say that they will assign different cryptocurrencies in different pots and then push it out to individuals depending. They say that once we've assigned different pools, there's a standard, a smart, and a stealth, then your crypto currency is then divvied out across those and then you get a payment back to the receiver in some fashion. The primary mode of operation here would be that, like, say, if I were buying goods on Vice City, I could go through a crypto mixer in order to send the payment. It's not necessarily easy, but it does provide a mechanism for hiding your transaction by moving through a crypto mixing service. And they talked about their legitimacy. How do you know that you can trust us? Because effectively you're sending us cryptocurrency, which has intrinsic economic value. So how do you know that we're gonna actually push product out like we say? And how do we maintain your security? Some vendors were quick to note that uh, they don't actually keep logs of who you are. When you go to the site, for instance, if you're going to a crypto mixer on the open web, they're going to have to maintain that information through servers and other pieces of information. So that creates an opportunity for law enforcement to track your behavior. If you've gone to the site, even if you are separate from the site because you're paying via cryptocurrency, if they can tie your IP address or retaining information that's on the, the server to you as an individual who owns this Bitcoin account, it creates a layer of risk for you. So they talk about how they don't maintain logs, how they're there to try to hide as much about you as is possible and make it difficult for police to find you and know that you engaged in a transaction. From there, the mixing process is relatively simple. So once you've found a vendor who you wanna work with, you can then go through the process of mixing. And so with this one, for instance, you have to input the Bitcoin wallet that you're interested in working with, and then say if you want any delay, so the payment's going to come over this period of time. Some of the vendors were quick to note that they uh, charged a service fee. So they're not doing this for free out of the goodness of their heart, but they'll take a percentage of the total. So if you're paying someone, uh, say 0.5 Bitcoin, they're going to proportionally charge on the amount that they have to mix for you. And most vendors operated on this kind of fee-based model where the amount is based on how much you're actually moving with them. And so once you put in all the relevant information, you then can hit complete and it goes from there. 
In terms of the percents, we saw a different pricing and it was variable. Most of them set a minimum in terms of how much you could mix, setting a baseline of 0.001 Bitcoin. So they're not just going to do $5 for you, but they are setting at least a, a general baseline fee. And they only charge transaction fees in some cases, and they try to set it as low as proportionally possible. And some vendors would charge a flat fee, although that was very rare. Flat fees are relatively uncommon, and they're going to base it off of how much you transfer. So if you're going with a large amount, they're going to reduce the overall price relative to a low value. So it's just dependent on the operator. One other thing to note, kind of talking about costs and benefits, is that in terms of pricing, setting a custom fee, as one vendor noted, made it possible for you to do different things. And so if they change the pricing and don't make it a flat static fee, it actually reduces the likelihood that you're going to be detected and it improves the overall quality of the service. So that way, you're not going to be identified as using a mixer because it's got an extra amount attached to it and then a payment goes out from that service. It's not necessarily clean, but it is an attempt to at least justify why they would charge a fee and why giving the customer the ability to set different fees may be valuable. In terms of tracking, it's not always possible to uh, track every single payment. Crypto analysis makes it possible to get most things, but mixing can make it a little more complicated to capture what's happening. And this service was quick to note that because transactions with fixed fees can be easily detected by law enforcement and forensic software, then we want you to be able to figure out what the best process is. So we use a random fee. That way it's gonna be harder to know, yes, this is a crypto mixing service because it's randomized as opposed to flat or some of their custom measure as with the last vendor. So in general, just to wrap things up, we see tons of different things for sale on the overall illicit marketplace online. And cryptocurrencies are the primary currency that vendors use. At the moment, it doesn't seem like there's any necessary fix to deal with these markets. They're constantly under attack by other actors within the community. There's lots of fraud and they're keenly aware of the fact that they're under law enforcement surveillance at all times. So a takedown of one site doesn't mean that the entire market folds, but rather it just creates kind of a blip where services are there, they disappear, and then customers go to other markets where they know that they can continue to make purchases. So as a consequence, it's hard to disrupt the market. The development of crypto mixing services makes it even harder because there's differential pricing in place and it makes it more complicated to identify transactions between customers. It's not impossible, but it increases the challenge. And the vendors are also quick to note that using a service like theirs makes it harder for tracing and tracking. And using different pricing structures can also be a way to potentially defeat that. One of the challenges that we see, though, is that in the rise of these services, you've got to figure out which uh, crypto mixing services are legitimate and which are not. And so that makes it incumbent on the customer to figure out the best way forward. So it's complicated. It may not be for everyone, but for vendors and customers who are interested and truly concerned about their safety, they may be inclined to use a mixing service. So this is something we're going to continue to watch and see what we can do in terms of better disruption through targeting of crypto mixing services. Is this a potential weak point in the market that could be exploited for takedown? So we're going to keep looking at the legitimacy, the reality of these vendors, how many are accurate and how many are just taking money, as well as look at how many customers and vendors encourage the use of crypto mixing. At least at the moment, we haven't observed a lot of uh, vendors saying, yes, use crypto mixing. They're keen to just take payment via whatever service makes the most sense for them. So we're looking at how this may be integrated across the entire market. And then finally, we're interested in looking at how any kind of change in the overall operations of the market are taking place as a function of the pandemic and its essential ending. If you look at the way that most people are going back to life pre-pandemic, is there gonna be any change in market operations as a whole? Um, I'll go ahead and stop there. And I just wanna thank you all for coming today and uh, open it up for questions.